The first little thing that says competent prayer, skip that. That's just a title. It starts with, to you, O Lord. this and we find you with a cell phone, we'll just take it. And you can get it back when we're ready to give it back. Could be 9 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Could be, you know. And I don't have a good memory when I take them. Uh, <laughs> return them. Okay, do you guys look up what the definition of economy is? Yeah. How many of you think that it has to do with money? No. And how come all the news people are always talking about the economy and how it stinks and blah, blah, blah. No, it's not a different economy. The word economy, it applies to that. It applies to salvation. So what does the word economy mean? That was Mr. John's question. And I second that question. What could it mean? you got to read that louder. <laughs> then you're going to probably have to interpret it for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I have to go with. Really they would? Economy comes from a Greek word, and it has several meanings. But the basic meaning of the word is handling, taking care of, disposition, managing. So when we talk about the economy of a country, 
we're talking about how it's managed. When we talk about this economy of salvation, we're talking about how God manages us. If we never knew there was a God, where would we be? Oh, no, no, we could be, but where would we be? <laughs> Pretty lost, I think. So, the topic today, we'll go through several iterations, I'm sure, is going to be God constantly stepping up to say, hey, 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 lost children, here am I, this is what I want you to do. He's managing our salvation. How did he achieve salvation? Why, or what, why, why do we need salvation? Okay. What's the point of salvation? I've got to get to heaven. What's the point of salvation? What's God's purpose? Why did he create the world the and the universe? The love. To love, okay? To share his love, to participate, partake in his love. To be part of his existence, to exist with him, okay? Very good. Now, what happened to that initial plan? Create on the sixth day. Plants. Okay, plants. Animals. People. People. And in particular, who? What two people do we call out in the Bible? Adam and Eve. Okay. And what were Adam and Eve's place when He created them? They were in the Garden of Eden. They were living what? They were living in the presence of God, right? Did God not come to the garden and visit them? So they're living in the presence of God, sharing in his love. What does he tell them to do? Not eat them. Uh, well, not so much the not, to do. Does he not give them stewardship of the garden? Okay, stewardship. What does it mean if you have stewardship over something? You don't own it. The, yeah, to take care of it. You're in charge of it. It is your responsibility to take care of it. So he gave Adam and Eve the stewardship of the garden of creation. Take care of the animals. Take care of the plants. Yes, they could use them as they were intended for food, okay. but to take care of them. That was what they were charged with. Remember, he brings the animals to Adam, and Adam gives them all a name. So they had stewardship of creation. Take care of the garden. They lived in the presence of God. They shared his love. They received his love. 
Then what? And what did he tell them they couldn't do? Eat from the tree of knowledge. That was the don't. Okay. Take care of creation. Take care of what I have created. Don't eat from this one tree. Of course, we know what happens. <coughs> Satan comes, tempts Eve. She gives in to that temptation. Adam's also tempted, gives in to the temptation. Thus destroying, damaging their relationship with God. Does God still love them? Yeah. Because what could he have done? Smite them. I like that word. Smite them. He could have destroyed them. Ended it all right there. No, he doesn't. Now, are there consequences for what they did? Yeah. And what are those consequences? They got thrown out of the garden. What else? There's other consequences. Yeah, life is much harder. They had everything they needed in the garden. Now they have to work for what they need. They have to toil. And it's not easy toil. Okay? They're still... They're still charged with being fruitful and multiplying. That's a much more painful process. <clears throat> so that the, they are kicked out of the garden. But the love is not completely shut off. There are consequences for it. And does God give up on... His desire to live in a relationship with us, with them, and with us? Yeah. No. Then he kicks in this plan for this uh, the plan for salvation. Now God being God knew what was going to happen all along. And he has a plan for it. And we've been talking about pieces of this plan. And this relationship and how this relationship with people has grown. We've talked about it, especially when we've done gone through the stories of the Old Testament. And we'll be talking about those relationships again today, those specific relationships. And there's a big word that starts with C that we've used to kind of define these relationships. Covenant. Covenant. Yeah. We, we, and why do you think we've been talking about it all year? Okay, that's yeah, important. Uh, yeah, otherwise we wouldn't keep constantly bringing it up. Well, why? Why is this? Why is the term covenant important? It's like a contract. Can I? Okay. Just so that everybody understands, a contract is typically an agreement between people for some thing. A covenant is a contract between people or an agreement between people and it's about people. The contract involves things between two parties for goods, exchange of things and typically the contract is limited in time. It's only good for X number of years. A covenant is between people it's an exchange of persons. It's eternal. There's no time limit. And it involves eternal relationships. So when God creates this agreement between people and himself, we call it a covenant because it does not have an end. It's not like, oh, well, he wore out and we have a new version. No, it keeps on going. And as Mr. John said, it first started with Adam and Eve. And who broke the agreement? Adam and Eve. Well, who do you think he's going to come to next and make an agreement? Who would be the next one to have an agreement? Uh, you guys know this because there's a symbol that he placed in the sky as a sign of that, of that covenant. And on 
a contract, what do you usually give? What do you usually do to seal the contract or what, what's the pledge? A signature. You give your name. You sign. If you ever buy a house, it's a lot of passing papers and signing. You adopt a child, it's even more signatures. <laughs> I started just doing this until somebody witnessed it. Uh, yeah. Because I remember I, 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 you know, went in the first time we bought a house, didn't think we were ever going to done passing papers. I remember doing that. And then when we adopted our children, I, which I guess it really should be more papers <laughs> and more signatures. Lots of signatures. So how do you, what, what are you pledging when you enter into a covenant? Usually a covenant with God. It's more than your name, isn't it? Yourself. Yourself. Your being. Your whole existence. Body and soul. That, that's another difference between a contract and a covenant. When Adam and Eve entered into the covenant, and we call that one a marriage covenant because they were husband and wife, and you know, they were given stewardship of creation, stewardship to be fruitful and multiply, to care for the world. They pledged themselves. And God pledged his whole being. These other covenants that we'll talk about are the same thing. They're pledging their whole self. Now, just like <coughs> when somebody breaks a contract, there spells out consequences, right? And I, ha I have your list. And as we talk, there are consequences for breaking a covenant also. There are curses. This is a term used in the Bible. Um, when you take the stand in the court to testify... You're in the witness box. What do you what do you do before you give your testimony? You swear an oath to do what? And and who who do you call upon to keep you in honor of that oath? You're calling on God, so you're bringing God into the into that and saying keep me honest here Lord and if not you're in charge of the consequences in fact not so much today but if you look back at older footages when the president was sworn in I mean they still use the Bible but do you know what passage the Bible's open to? Uh, nope. If it is in the older ones, but it is open. The section in Deuteronomy laying out the curses of the covenant. So there are professions where we call upon God to enter into our pledge to be part of that pledge. Can you think of some? And have you ever, ever heard of the Hippocratic Oath? Who takes the Hippocratic Oath? Oh. Yeah. Well, we'll... Doctors! <laughs> Doctors! They pledge an oath And why do you think we, the doctors do that? Why, why, why is that a practice for doctors to do that? To not mess up your insides. But why, why, why would that be something we'd ask them to do? So they 
Why was that tradition there? Because we trust them with our, we have to trust them with our lives. Okay, there are others that take oaths. Now, in today's society, the taking of the oath does not carry the same weight it used to. Unfortunately. But I, I wanted to get into the oaths a little bit before we move forward. Just And through these covenants, what is God doing? When he makes, I mean, we have this covenant with Adam and Eve in a few minutes, we'll talk about the covenant with Noah, and so on and so on and so on. And ending in the final covenant. In each of these covenants, these points we're going to talk about, what's God doing? Well, he'd make it, well, yeah, there, there, there's promises involved. But is he not revealing himself? Is he not teaching us who he, he is? Showing us who he is? You know, that, as we talk through, let's let that kind of run through. So in the first one with Adam and Eve, he's making himself known as God. Okay. I'm the creator. Then we said Noah was the next covenant. So what was his covenant with Noah? To flush everyone out. Okay, yeah. He, he flood, he, God is going to flood the world. Why is God flooding the world? Yeah, get rid of the evil, get rid of the sinful people. Start again with creation. Okay. So what does he tell, ask Noah to do? He didn't tell Noah to do. What does he ask Noah to do? To bring the animals. To build an ark to do, to, to save the animals. Okay. Could God have made the ark? Could God say, oh, yep, ark, B. Yeah. And Noah had an ark. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but he didn't do that, did he? Now, was Noah a shipbuilder no. of giant ships? I don't think so. No, I'm saying he may have been a builder of small ships, but he's he a minor research right he's a trade. Okay. So that's so good but did God give him make it so many cubits by so many cubits and put the door here and that kind of stuff? Okay. God did that. Provided the material, the lumber. Yeah, the lumber and everything. So why do you think God had Noah build the ark versus just there's the ark? To test his faith. Okay, cool. And when God enters into these covenants and things, we have to have a part. So God will not do the part that we're capable of doing. No one was capable of providing the labor to build the boat, to build the ark. You do think old people can't do anything? Yeah. Their back can break, I don't know. You don't have to be old. <laughs> so, and Mr. Jack can build stuff. <laughs> No doggone well and good that if I'm at a salad bar, I can build a nice mountain out of salad and other things. I decorate the grass. Why are you skip over the salad bar? No, I don't. <laughs> so in this, God doesn't do the parts we can do. Now, getting the animals to come on board That's and behave and everything, Noah couldn't do that. He wasn't a... Uh, Giraffe whisperer, lion tamer. Right. But anyway, we have this covenant. Who who goes with Noah besides the animals? His family. His family. His wife. And who else? His sons. His sons and their wives. 
So we see an expansion of this covenant. The first covenant was with Adam and Eve, husband and wife. It also goes back to why when we enter into the sacrament of marriage, it is a sacrament, it's a marital covenant, because it's the husband, the wife, and God. All the way back to Adam and Eve. We see that at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. Now we have Noah, and we've expanded this covenant to the family unit. And at the end, after the ark's come to rest, the water's dried up, the animals have left, God promises what? To not destroy the world again by water, by flooding. And as a symbol of that, what does he give? Rainbow. The rainbow. What you think about is a pretty, pretty marvelous, miraculous thing. And what does Noah do to seal the covenant? Well, that does come, but that's a little later. That's not, not exactly to seal the covenant. That's not to seal the covenant. He does get drunk. That is part of his story. That is not how he seals the covenant. That just shows that people are sinners. Even though they have picked by God as righteous, doesn't mean they're perfect. He sends yeah. out birds. Well, he sends out birds at first. But remember, how many animals did he take on the ship? Remember we took... He took two of every kind, but of the clean animals, he took seven pairs. Wait, what are the clean animals? Like sheep, like sacrifice. Yeah, right, sacrifice. So goats? Oh, he did a sacrifice. Goats and lambs are clean. Pigs are not. And there, there, if you read in there, it tells you clean and unclean. But it's basically shellfish or not. Cloven hooved animals are not considered clean. Those are not animals for sacrifice. Well, that was back in this. Thank you. That's kind of what we're getting to. Why did God? Did God really? Did God really need Noah to kill these animals? These clean animals? No, he didn't need that. But the giving up, the shedding of blood, was a way for man to seal the covenant of God. Okay. It, was, it was a way, particularly back in that time, to seal a covenant that was our action as for sealing the covenant. And they also would sacrifice unblemished animals. They didn't have any defect, visual defects. So the bottom line is, this is the best I have, uh, sacrificing it to you, brother. Yeah, because if you think back, the the uh, Cain and Abel, Cain gave what out of his crops? I gotta say, Cain gave the leftovers. But Abel gave what? The, the first fruits of the sheep, the best, the unblemished. Now, this is also all foreshadowing us getting to the final covenant and how it was seen. Okay. We'll get to it. It, it, it is, it's building to that. We're, we're seeing that in these early pieces. Okay. Now, remember, this whole thing is based off what we said is the salvation, or rather the economy, of salvation. So this is God coming at us constantly with these things, these covenant agreements. And we keep screwing it up. Yeah, we keep screwing it up. But it's also, you know, he's managing his relationship with us because from the beginning we weren't ready for everything. People have to be 
ready for this. So now we have Noah. Exit Noah. Who comes next? We've talked about him. Abram. Abraham. Okay. So let's talk about the relationship of God and Abraham. What is Abraham asked to do? Mm, that's later on. That, that is later on. That you, you are correct, but that, that's towards the end of his story. What did Abram, Abram do before he became Abraham? What was he asked to do? Yeah. Move. Yeah, move. Get off the boat. Trust me, leave your home and go to this other land. And who did he take with him? Okay, he, he took else? He took his wife, but who else went with him? Servants. Took everybody. He also take his nephew? What was his nephew's name? No, it no. starts with an L. Uh, Isaiah. Uh, no, he, he was around for Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Not Luke. But it did start with an L. Three letters. Should we play? Yeah, we can do that. Let's play Hangman. Yeah, that'd be fun. I'm feeling like it's three letters. It's three letters. Starts with L. What letter does it start with? Well, what letter does it end with? A letter out of the alphabet. Ham. No, but the guy. The guy's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. What? You've never heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? No. Okay, let's say. Should I look them up or do I have to like do I have to suffer? Actually, they found the place where they believe is Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was like, well, how did it get destroyed? And now they think that there may have been a meteorite that came down, broke up, set the whole town on fire, killed everybody. Well, dang. Really happened, huh? They were turning salt, though. No. Uh -oh. Only, Only this guy's wife. Only this guy's wife. Right? You still got a guess. You still got a guess? L O what? L O what? L O, you're close. Okay, we have two letters now. Lot. 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 Okay. Lot is his name. Okay. Because that's what his mother gave him. I'm sure. I'm sure you tonight you did something with this one. I, I don't particularly remember. What? What is a stupid name? That's all I'm going to say. I didn't pick the name. Okay. So he takes his, not just his immediate family, but the tribe. What? His nephews. So we have an expansion of this covenant again. Not only is Abram and Sarai moving, leaving their home, leaving Ur, going to the promised land, but they're taking everyone and all their relation with them. And they move to the promised land. If you thought you guys were what other promises did God make to Abraham? His descendants would be as numerous as the stars. Or as the, what was the other? Sand on the beach. Sand on the seashore. How many children did, at that time, did Abraham and Sarah ha or Sarah have? None. They were old. Abram was 75. How old are you? Older than dirt. That's the only guy that's called. He was in the tribe whenever they were moving. How old was he when his son was finally born? Hundred and one. 
Because what did his wife do when she heard the messenger say, oh, next year at this time when I come back through, you'll have a child? She didn't believe it. She laughed. I could, I could just envision Terry laying on the ground laughing, holding her stomach. It's like, we're going to, what? I'm old. Were you crazy? <laughs> Please don't make me in this age. Because <laughs> believe me, I say that now. I don't want to start over with <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> a few years ago, when one of my friends, who's actually six months older than I am, with having his third child. Damn. No. <laughs> I about got mine out of the house. No. <laughs> but anyway. So they name the child what? What do you mean? Cain. Isaac. What is it? Does it start with an L? I swear. It starts with an L. No. Starts with an I. Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaac. Wood. Wood. The wood for the sacrifice. Okay. 
Okay. We have a young man carrying the wood for the sacrifice. What is that foreshadowing? That he's about to die. Is that not foreshadowing that? Who carried the wood? Oh, Jesus. And Jesus was the only son of God. Isaac is the only legitimate son of <laughs> Abraham. <laughs> Abraham. And, and I make that just, just because, like I said, God said the descendants would come through Isaac. Right. But it was going to come through. So we're foreshadowing even back then. God, the economy of salvation, God manning the, managing this relationship, bringing us as his creatures, his creation, along to get us to salvation. And Isaac asked, hey, Dad, something's missing. What's, he, what's missing? The servant? The sacrifice. The sacrifice, the sacrifice is missing. What is Abraham's response? God will provide. God will provide the sacrifice. And he did. Okay. So now, yes, fast forward a little bit. We climb up the mountain. We pile up the wood. He ties up Isaac. Okay, now think about it. How old was Abraham when Isaac was born? He's 101. Okay. Isaac's a young man. Okay. Um, the 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 exact age we don't know. It varies. Some say a teenager. Some say thirty-ish. Okay. Okay. So that's the point I'm getting to. Even if he's a teenager, if he's in his twenties, if he's thirty-ish. And that Abraham is anywhere between 115 and 132. Okay. Could Isaac have overpowered him? Yup. Yeah. Okay. But what did he do? He willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed. Do you think he knew from the beginning what was going to happen? Yeah. I mean, there's no, there is no animal. Dad's got everything else. <laughs> so yeah, Isaac true. had to go along willingly, didn't he? Yeah, he, he, said he did God. ask. He did ask. And God will, God, you know, his answer, Abraham's answer was God will provide. But if you think about it, he's going along willingly. At any point, he could have said, I'm out of here. Okay. But we are foreshadowing the crucifixion, are we not? God's only son, could he have stopped that at any point? Yes. Yes, he could have. He could have. Not only that, Jesus did ask, let it pass. Yeah. So, with the story of Abraham and Isaac, we have human beings, creations of God. God says, this is what I want, and they are obedient. Both of them. They obey God. This is part of God's salvation. It's a test. And at the last second, he says, stop. Yeah, I think at the last second, what happens? He no, bro. Yeah, stop, in, stop, stop. In Jesus' case, he asked his father, let this pass. And what did God say? didn't stop it. Jesus yeah. could have stopped this thing. You stop and you think this this is something that in my mind sometimes I just go, how? Jesus is God. At any point he could have said enough. And it would have been done. And I don't understand why he didn't. I'm looking at it from a human standpoint. It don't make any sense to me. But he didn't. He went ahead, and the mortal Jesus died on the cross. What about the eternal Jesus? He lives. Oh, he still lives. He lives. And that's the promise that we're given. 
but we'll get to that later. And when God stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, what does he provide? A goat. A ram. A ram. A ram. ram. But he, even more than just a ram. Describe that ram. It had huge horns. No blemishes. Unblemished. Unblemished. Because remember, the animal of sacrifice should be the finest. And, that unblemished. And what was the ram caught in? A thorn bush. Of thorns. Oh. <laughs> thorn it is all there. It is all there. You can see it looking backwards. The un, because one of the names that we give Jesus is the the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Walked around his head. Crown of thorns. Crown of thorns. And, and, and were those the little thorns we have on our rose bushes, by the way? No. Wait, so no it wasn't was a big one. It wasn't a big one. Thorns about that long. It looked like a nail. Well, they're about that long. They're about an inch, okay. to an inch and a half long. Yeah, a nail. Let's, let, let's explore this just a second. I had a question over, or a statement over here. See what the class thinks of it. Jesus was not unblemished on the cross. True or false? His body was blemished. His body was blemished. Yeah, his body was blemished. Absolutely. Because he had been what? No, not whipped. Whipped is very different than what was done to him. He got tortured. He was scour scourged. What's that mean? The whips are leather whips with metal and glass. I and glass. Oh, yeah. Cut stone. Bone. Yeah, I mean, just sharp pieces in them so that when you whip across and pull back, what do they do? They rip your flesh. It's not it's not mom taking the wooden spoon and whacking your butt like she did me many, 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 many times. <laughs> because I deserved it. <laughs> it's not that. That was not what was done. Okay. And it was done to the point, if you think about a Jewish flogging, a Jewish scourging with how many lashes? Forty minus one. Thirty-nine. Why? What is a Roman scourging? A typical Roman scourging was until the person being scourged died, or the person providing the scourging got exhausted. When we went on that retreat, like, wasn't there a cross? Yes, if you go, you will see some crosses. We have quite often in artwork sanitized the crucifixion. Yeah, it looks a lot more bad. We have sanitized the crucifixion. Because if you actually read the accounts and know the practices of the time, there was no flesh left on him. No flesh. All the skin had been torn off. Because even what was left, you think about what was left after the scourging, what, what happened to him next? After the scourging, they did what to him? They draped him in what, what color of, of cloth? Purple robes and put on the crown of thorns. Right? Because he was the king of the Jews. So they dressed him up as a king. Okay. If you have a cut and you put cloth over it and then you take that cloth off it takes everything with it. Yeah, Any clotting that had happened is ripped away. Okay, that was done. Think about that. 
So, now let's get back to, okay, we know physically his body was extremely abused. Okay, we'll just, we'll just go with that. But was he unblemished? No, no. His soul. His soul. His soul. Had, he all, had, he, had he always been obedient to God? Yeah. Had he always done the Father's will? Yes. Had he ever committed sin? Had he ever been tempted to commit sin? Yes. Yes. Okay. So was he was he unblemished? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because we're not talking the physical state of his body. We are talking about his soul, his state, his, his very essence. Okay. So that's Abraham. And then we've jumped away with it. We've kind of jumped ahead to the other. But like see, we see a lot of foreshadowing in the relationship between Abraham, Isaac, and God in the beginning of the covenant. This, this, how this, their covenant played out. So now we have the, the, the what, what kind of happens to the people, the descendants of Abraham. Spread out. Because Isaac... Has how many children? Uh, two. two. Isaac has two children. What are their names? Jacob. Esau. Jacob. Esau and Jacob. The two twins. The two twins that drink the soup today. No, they traded the soup. With the father's blessing. They traded the soup for the birthright. I hear what they're How did Jesus mark the covenant? Or not Jesus. How did God mark the covenant with Noah? The rainbow. The rainbow. The rainbow. What marks the covenant between Abraham and God? The circumcision of the male. Well, that's who we're talking about. <laughs> Abraham, this is the Jewish people. At this point, that's who the covenant is with. Okay, at this point. So the cutting of the foreskin of the males was the symbol or the mark of his covenant. That's right, we don't. And, it, and it's not that we are breaking it, it's that Jesus has fulfilled all these things already, taken away the need to do it. Sure, yeah. so do Anglos. I mean, you know, I mean, so do Gentiles. But if you think back to a lot of the readings, in the readings of the Acts of the Apostles that we have, this became a very big sticking point in the early Christians as the Gentiles were coming into the faith and believing, the Jews were saying, wait a minute, let me do something. <laughs> They're not fulfilling the law. <laughs> okay. That, that, they had to have a big conference over this, big meeting. <laughs> Is it a requirement? If you become a Christian, a follower of the way, as it was known at that time, you have to be circumcised. So, after Easter, when we're reading Acts, look for that discussion. When we're reading the Acts of the Apostles. So, we have Abraham. He has Isaac. Isaac has two children, the twins. Esau, the firstborn. Jacob, clutching at his heels, trying to get ahead. What happens to the two of them? They give they argue Jacob and his mother scheme to steal the birthright, the blessing from Esau. So Jacob receives the birthright and the blessing. Because Esau gives it to him for a bowl of soup. 
And then they ah, steal yes, the blessing. Yes. Remember that story? Okay. They, Jacob kind of flees for his life. But eventually both Mary have children, have Jacob begins to prosper. So does Esau. Birthright suit gifts children. Do they reconcile? Yes. Yeah. They do. They reconcile. And Jacob wrestles with who? Uh, stranger. Stranger. Messenger of God. And he gets uh, he gets one of those. Things we see a lot in the Bible, especially when people have encounters with God. Get the new name, right? Oh, yeah. What's his new name? Wait, what was it? What's Jacob's new name? He's another one of those that gets a new name. Jacob. Okay, what's the first letter? What's the first letter for children? I. Israel. Israel. Oh, yeah. Israel. Israel means to or to wrestle with God. Yes, actually, yes, it does. And why was he given the name Israel? Because he wrestles with God. And 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 actually, how the how the angel what the angel do at the end end of the in the morning after they wrestled all night? Went home. he did something to uh, Jacob first. Played Stephen Seagal and broke something. Dislocated his hip. Ow. Well, he was able to get up and walk around. I guess he would. Have a dozen kids. I mean, at least, you know, so I guess that is you. Yeah, so how many descendants, direct descendants, did Israel now, Jacob, and all of Israel now, have? One. Twelve. Also became known the as the, the, twelve tribes. Tribes. the Twelve Tribes of Israel. Hallelujah, they've learned <laughs> Oh, my God, they're getting some of this. See, the pieces fit together. Okay, the pieces fit together in this. Okay. So we have the 12 tribes of is the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel, being the descendants of the 12 sons of Israel, or Jacob. Okay. What do we know about those sons, particularly one of them? Joseph. That's exactly the one I was thinking of. Joseph. What happens to Joseph? He gets sold into slavery. Wait, is that when he got put into the well? Yes. Okay. Yes, he was the favored son. He was the second from the youngest. Yes, he could tell the future. And he was he humble about it? No. No, not exactly. He was very boastful. He was very boastful. He liked to tell his brothers that, oh, I've had a vision of you all bowing down before me and all that. Yeah, he, 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 he did bring some of this on himself. He had it coming. He had it coming. Okay. I didn't say he had it coming, but... But, you see, some of these things happen to advance the plan, okay? God's plan of salvation. Okay, so we have Joseph slowed into slavery. Where does Joseph end up? Egypt. Egypt. What would you say? And does he remain a slave? No. No, what, what does he eventually become? King. No, he doesn't become king and it would be Pharaoh in Egypt. Advisor, governor, steward of the household, basically, right? He got management of basically management of all goods. Because who was it that built had the barns built? It was Joseph. I mean, the Pharaoh said, "Go do this," because he told Pharaoh, "We're going to have seven years of what?" Now, first, well, we have seven years of what? Surplus. Seven years of surplus. Then 
seven years of famine. So we need to, in that years of surplus, do what? Save it. So Pharaoh says, go do it. So he becomes basically like governor, or the steward of the household. Yeah, he's I mean, Pharaoh's advisor, but it even goes more beyond just advising. Because originally he came in to interpret the dreams, but it even went beyond that. It was, go run things. Go be the steward. Going back to this stewardship, another meaning of the word economy, to manage the household. So God has now placed Jacob, Joseph, in Egypt, in a position of authority, to gather the surplus in the years of bounty for the years of famine. What happens to his family during the years of famine? They die. They, die. they don't die. They go to Egypt for food. Well, they're, they're already kind of in, they're already in Egypt, but they, yeah, they're, they're starving, so they go to Somewhere. Joseph, not knowing who he really is, and say, we need help. Do they recognize him? Oh, his brothers? Hmm? Do, do, do his brothers recognize him? No. no. Does he recognize them? Yes, yes absolutely. Okay, so now he's in a position of power. His vision is coming true, right? He's in a place to exact revenge. Yeah, he could say, I have no food for you. Yeah, absolutely, he could have. But what does he do? Well, not right away. He does. He does. He does make some. Uh, he gives some food for. He gives him some things to do. But yes. Yes. Basically, he forgives. Does he finally reveal himself? Yeah. Okay. He has to So he reveals himself. They make it all. They all make it through the famine. Now they're living where? In Egypt. In Egypt. Let God bless you. What happens to? The descendants uh, of the twelve sons of Israel. Um, they make amends. Well, they, no, they make well, their descendants. What happens to the children? Are they multiplying? Yeah. Are they becoming as numerous as the stars? Yeah, we're not quite to the to the stars level yet, but yes, the stars are coming. They're getting there. Okay. While this is happening, okay, the Israelites are being fruitful and multiplying where? In the land of Egypt. And what are the Egyptians seeing happening? There are getting to be too many of them. Too many. Kill. No, slavery. Slavery. But also, then we have some prophecies. Moses. And what is Pharaoh order done in the time of Moses' birth? Yes. The murder of the innocent. Okay. Go kill the Egyptian male children. Wait, only male? Okay, what is that foreshadowing? Um, Does that ever come up again? Yes, Jesus' birth. The, the oh. Birth. oh. Oh. It oh. does, doesn't it? It comes up again. There's so much lore. <laughs> so much of this lore. No, lore it's, it's not lore. This is not lore. <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> but Moses is spared. And actually, by by the very act, if you think about it, by the very act of Pharaoh ordering the massacre of the innocents, does he really not set into motion everything that's to follow? Because if the Egyptians were not running around killing the firstborn of the Hebrews the males of the Hebrews, the little children, would Moses have been placed in a basket on the river for Pharaoh's daughter to find? No. 
No, there'd be no reason to put her in the basket. Or put him in the basket. Right? But because he's put in the basket, he's raised as a member of Pharaoh's household. Yeah. And actually, who who's with him? Who cares for him? Well, yeah, but do you, do you, do you think Farrell's daughter's the one that's changing his nappy? It was the wife. I don't know. I'm guessing the wife. Well, his 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 mother, actual mother's brought in to be his wet nurse. And but his his sister. The one that watched over him when he was in the basket and kind of helped make sure the Pharaoh's daughter found him is the one that basically cares for him as his nanny. Oh, so, yeah. oh, so she's a nanny. Right. But, okay, so what happens? He grows up. Moses grows up. He's out one day. And what does he see happening? He sees, yes, an Egyptian abusing Israelites. So what does he do? Stop. Tries to stop the Egyptian, but ends up killing him. Right? Stop the Egyptian, ends up killing him. Ends up doing the stab and And what does he do with the body? Hide it. Hide it. Go bury it in the desert. Hide it. Hey, then what happens? He got in trouble for it. Not, not immediately. What's he come upon the next day? Does he come upon two Israelites fighting each other? I'm not sure. Yeah. And he tries to stop that, and what do they say to him? You killed the dude. Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Ooh. Ooh, you in trouble. So he thinks everybody knows, so what does he do now? Kill him again. He runs. He runs. Away. Run, Forrest, run. Run, Moses, run. He runs. He flees. He leaves Egypt. Well, and yeah, then, then he finds. Does he find a place to live? Or is, he, or, or is he always just constantly on the move? Is he like Forrest, just constantly running? Yeah, he, he finds a place to live. Becomes a shepherd. He settles down, gets married, becomes a shepherd. And one day he's out shepherding. And what does he see? Burning bush. Burning bush. What's so special about a burning bush? Have you ever never seen a lightning strike in a forest fire? It was in a cave. It didn't burn. It wasn't being consumed. It was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. Was it not in a cave? No. No, it was on a mountain. You're thinking of Elijah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we have the burning bush. <laughs> what comes forth from the bur burning bush? The voice of God. And and what is what does the voice tell Noah or Noah? Moses to do as he approaches. Take off your sandals because what? You're walking on holy ground. Holy ground. What does he ask Moses to do? Go back to Egypt and free my people. Moses said, Yay, let's go. But does he obey God? Yep. Yes. Well, he does. I've been, I've been a little persuasion by God, but yeah. Well, do we obey God the first time God tells us to do something? No. Oh, no, not most of the time. I know I for sure don't. What, what did Moses do when God told him what he wanted Moses to do? Made up excuses. Made up excuses. What was the big excuse that Moses made up? I 
He's on the run. What? He's like on the run. No, it's believed that Moses stuttered. And therefore, he would look stupid That's in, what he front, says. in front of Pharaoh. <laughs> so who did God say, okay, fine, and send to help him? His brother. Named his brother. What was his brother's name? I don't know. Aaron. 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 Very good. Because actually, if you, the, the miracles, or the plagues, the miracles, plagues, Okay, so Moses goes back, confronts Pharaoh, says, let the Israelites go. Pharaoh said, yeah, I'll take my free labor and go. Nope. He said, convince me. Because, you think about it, in Egypt, Pharaoh is basically a god. A god. Pharaoh is, is a god. He's not, he's not king. He's not king. It's much. It's yeah. It, it, it's it's much more than that. To them, he, he is God. So you know, he's like, yeah, I'm God. Convince me, because when the plagues, we now start having the plagues. The plagues come in <coughs> one by one, and. Who is Moses? Actually, is it Moses that's doing the plagues, or what, what's being used to start the plague? Um, well, it's spe- a specific thing I'm looking for here. What does shepherd carry? A staff. A staff. A crocher. Okay. But is it Moses's that's being used? Darren. Darren. This will come back. We'll get to that. That's one of the things that ends up going into the Ark of the Covenant. Is there in Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fruit on the ground turned into a snake. So what did Pharaoh do? He called his magicians and said, "Do, do your trick." And they came in, they did their trick. They created snakes out of sticks. What did Aaron's snake do that God had created? It ate them. But, okay, that's the first plague. So at each plague, it keeps getting worse. Keeps pushing further. At, at, you know, at a couple of times, Pharaoh's about to give in, but his stubbornness overrides. Okay. Now we get to the final plague. What's the final plague? Kills Death, of the Death of the firstborn. Of whom? Okay. Of everyone and. Oh, and the And the animals too. Not only. Not only not only they can't paint blood on a house. They can't figure it Not only the not only is the angel of death going to take the firstborn of the Egyptians and the Israelites, it's also the animals. That ain't fair. They can't paint blood on they can't take their own blood and paint it on their how did they find out? Like how did they find out? Well they break their bones, yeah. Okay, how did they find out? To put the blood on the door. Uh, Moses. Did he do it in public? God told Moses, have the people do this. On this day of this month, go out and procure an unblemished lamb. It can be of the goats or a year old. Unblemished lamb. It could be of the goats or the sheep. Okay. It could be a goat or it could be a sheep. Bring it home, keep it for so many days, then start preparing it in this way. If your family is small, too small to have a goat of its own, no, get with join another family. Because part of it too, 
Yes, they had to kill, sacrifice the unblemished lamb. Okay, you all did remember, paint the door with the blood. Okay, so what's the door frame made out of? Wood. And what are we putting on it? Blood. Oh! Oh! <laughs> The doorway to where? Through the crucifixion, through the sacrifice on the cross, open the doorway to what? Heaven. Salvation. The doorway. Okay. Foreshadowing. Unblemished. Firstborn. Okay. So paint the doors. But also, how were they to eat the meal? Yeah, fully dressed, shoes on, all your stuff together, ready to leave immediately. And to eat the meal. Okay? So we also have this coming together at table, too. When do we come together at table? The Last Supper. But not just the Last Supper. Every meal. Every meal. Well, if you're not busy. How about every Mass? Because what what was God's command to them also about this meal? That they memorialize it, right? Do the Jewish people still not celebrate Passover every year? They do. Because, why do they do that? Because they love eating lamb? No, because God told them to. It's their participation in that first Passover night. Okay. Why do we at every Mass come to table? It's a perpetual sacrifice. It is not, it, it's not a new sacrifice. It's our participation in the sacrifice. Just like when the Jewish faith celebrates Passover. It's participation in that Passover. Their first Passover. The actual Passover. Okay, so we have the meal. We're eating it. Then the angel of death descends. Okay, so what does Pharaoh, Pharaoh do then? Get out! <laughs> I'm done. Get out. So they flee. Then Pharaoh's stubbornness sets in. Sends him out. And he goes and has all his chariots and charioteers chase the Israelites across the desert. Okay? Who's protecting the Israelites? Moses. Okay? What person of God? The Holy Spirit. And how is the Holy Spirit manifest? How, how do the people see the Holy Spirit in this case? The water being separated. No, before that. Red sea. Before we even get to the Dead Sea. Oh. It's portrayed, it, it is, they, they see it in two forms. A dark cloud. Yeah, dark swirling cloud. But there's also a pillar of salt. Pillar of salt. That was Lot. <laughs> that was Lot's wife a long time ago. Lot? No, not Lot. Don't bring up Lot. What's the other? What, what's one of the other symbols of the Holy Spirit? What? What appeared above? It seems as if it appeared above the apostles of that. Fire. Tongues of fire. Okay. So the, the Holy Spirit protecting God, the Holy Spirit protecting the Israelites, leading them with a column of fire at night. Also, dark cloud. And can the, do the Egyptians catch up to them? Yeah. No, they come within range. But if you, if you remember, if you read the passages, they're, when they come up to the Dead Sea, he tells Moses to put out Aaron's staff. The wind, the wind blows all night long. Remember that? The wind blows all night long. During the night, the cloud moves to the back between the two camps 
and keeps them apart. God's protecting. We also have the breath of God, the wind, parting the water, drying out the land. The next morning, trot across the sea, and God spurns the Egyptians on with, you can get them, boys. Keep going. Have any of you ever heard of the term Seish? Seish? Seish. A Seish typically happened, well, the one I'm most familiar with is Lake Michigan. And in Lake Michigan, the wind can start to blow, and if it blows long and hard enough, it moves all the water over toward the Michigan side. And that water moves away from the Illinois side. But then it piles up over there and comes screaming back. And anybody that's uh, on a shoreline by in Illinois ends up being drowned. So where this took place, it's like, well, how did God do that? How did Moses do about it? It's possible that God didn't perform a miracle or a magic act that with the wind blowing, it created a sage. The land was dry for the Israelis. But when the Egyptians came in, it came slamming back. Yeah, I was going to say. Well, yeah, I was going to say, it, 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 we tend to think of this in terms of Hollywood and the way it's portrayed in movies. Yeah, I thought that. Okay. It doesn't mean that's the way it really happened. There, there are natural ways these things happen. Okay, so we have the Egyptians charging after them. The water flows back, they die. killing the Egyptians. Okay. They were warped. They were. They were in chariots. They were weighted down with armor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They were going into battle. They weren't. They weren't going to the beach. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Grab well, a well, just think about it. Swimming in, in uh, Gunner's Hole Lake. See how that works out. Yeah. And 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 uh, as as Jack said, when this when the, you think about it, when our, a tsunami. You ever you know what a tsunami is? Yeah. Water rolls out. Does it come back gentle? No. No. Nope. <laughs> Clears everything in its path. Okay, that that's the forces we're talking about here. Natural forces. Okay. So the Israelites. Woohoo! We're free. Everything's good. So they gotta get to the promised land. They gotta get to the promised land. Are are they faithful to God? No, they are worshiping a golden bull. Okay, let's get to that. Well, did, first, did they not start grumbling? Well, I may have my own things out of order, but did they not start grumbling also? Yeah, they, yeah, they argued. We had food when we were in Egypt. Now we're out here. What are we going to eat? I'm thirsty. I'm tired. Moses, are we there yet? How long is this going to take? I'm hungry. Sound like a bunch of what? Frustrated. Little humans. children. Humans. 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 Yeah, humans. Like and it's not just little children, but yeah, little children. First graders. Sounds like me. So God provides. Excuse me. So what does God provide for them to eat? Honey, milk. Bread. Bread that fell from the sky. Bread from heaven, right? Manna. Bread from heaven. That, see, dew fall. The, at night, the dew would fall. There would be little flakes. Gather the flakes up. Make bread for them. Okay. Yeah. Then they start complaining. Well, and how much how much manna did they give them each day? How much manna came down? Manna. The bread from heaven. Oh. Just what they needed. Just what they needed. Because if they tried to keep it, what happened? It was spoiled. Okay. Except on the sixth day. What would happen on the sixth day? The, se the Sabbath is the seventh day. And, the, and on the Sabbath, Sabbath, they rest, right? So on the sixth day, they would get a double portion. They feast. So that they could rest on the Sabbath. Okay. Then they start complaining. We're tired of bread. All we ever eat is bread. 
<laughs> but why did he send them? Milk. Well, okay. And how do they, how, oh, I'm thirsty. What's he do for the thirst? Milk. Water. Rock. Gently tap the rock. Gently tap the rock. In fact, what does Moses do? <laughs> no, Moses gets frustrated and taps it twice. All right? Taps it once. So are they grateful for all this? No. no. Not really, no. In fact, what does God curse them with? Hunger. Not, not specifically for this. This generation will not enter into the... They will not enter the promised land. Your descendants will, but you all won't. In fact, Moses, even for his lack of trust, lack of faith in tapping the water, getting the water from the rock, is a, doesn't enter the promised land. He sees it, but doesn't enter the promised land. Well, I okay, so let's wrap up with these two little thoughts here on this, and we'll pick up from here next week. Okay, so the manna is bread from heaven. What's that foreshadowing? Um, the Last Supper. The Last Supper where Jesus is the bread, bread, of, the life. bread, the bread of life. The bread from heaven. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. Okay. So we still have, we have that foreshadowing back here with Moses. And just on the natural things there are in the areas where they were walking, there is water below the surface. And by breaking through rock, you can get the water out if you know where to break the rock. So it's not an impossible thing. Okay, we'll pick up with the covenant with Moses next week. Who's going to lead us in our closing prayer? Young lady right here in a plum shirt, jacket, whatever. All she has to comfort her is her phone. Oh. Oh, what you? Right there. Share a Bible with her. Please, somebody that has a Bible that she can use, uh, pick a psalm. Let's do Psalm 1. Psalm 1? Psalm 1. Six, page 668. Six, Happiness in God's law. That sounds like a good one. Lead the way. 